right, we're going to get started. Um, thank you everyone who's joining in person and online for the first uh, RSM speaker series installment of the semester. Um, we're really excited to welcome John Lucas Franchini um, from Boston University. Um, but before John Luca takes the floor, uh, he's going to be introduced by Joe Walter, one of our visiting scholars this term. Uh, Joe is the Bertelstein Presidential Chair in Technology and Society at UCSB. Uh, he's also a distinguished professor of communication and the former director of the Center for Information Technology and Society. Um, and with that, Joe. Thank you. thank you, Nick, and thank you also, Nick, uh, for arranging the speaker series and uh, providing me for John Luca to, to come today. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a fan of John Luca Stringini. He, he does. Uh, he does computer science work that I can understand, and that's saying a lot. Uh, but um, uh, John Luca and his colleagues, they, they've been looking at a lot of the things that concern us online in terms of hate speech, uh, misinformation, conspiracies, and so forth. And, and you know, it's, it's not hard to find an instance of any of these things. But uh, uh, John Luca and his colleagues have uncovered the process of this, how, how the actors responsible for this move across domains and move across platforms and and uh, what some of the content is that that they move and coordinate in their work when i discovered uh, uh their work it, it blew my mind it was really nice solid evidence illustrated in really fascinating ways in the papers that they write to uh, just help blow open some of the social dynamics uh that that otherwise are only represented by static instances of hate messages and so forth. So uh, I've, I'm impressed and a, a big fan of his work. And, and uh, then I asked John Luca for his uh, Vita. Now I don't like him anymore because I'm jealous. Uh, he has uh, uh, recently tenured as an associate professor. He has scads of publications uh, uh, and conference proceedings and articles. He has millions and millions of dollars in grants. He's done anything that you uh, would ever want an academic uh, to do. Uh, but beyond that, as I said, his work is meaningful and exciting and detailed and precise and tells us a whole lot. So thanks for coming today. And thanks, John Luca, for joining us to tell us about your research. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much for the for the kind introduction and uh, well, good morning or good afternoon, <laughs> everybody. It's uh, it's great to be here. So as uh, as Joe said, I'm a computer scientist. So uh, what I do, I develop computational techniques to better identify and understand malicious online activity. So I started looking at uh, malware, online fraud, spam, this kind of automated uh, bad activities that we are all familiar with. More recently, I was drawn into this uh, rabbit hole, if you like, of uh, online hate and conspiracy theories and uh, misinformation and so on. So today I want to give you an overview of some work uh, I've been doing with my students and my collaborators on you know, better uncovering uh, what's going on uh, out there. Uh, and to start, I want to give you an example of something that happened to me um, a couple of years ago now. So one day, um, I was sitting in my office and I started receiving weird emails that, uh, you know, look completely random. So the first one uh, was this email where uh, uh, somebody was asking me for advice uh, on how to cope with a recent wave of, you know, hate and bigotry and uh, anti-Semitism and all of that. This was uh, um, early 2017, just to put it in, uh, into context. Uh, okay, you know, uh, kind of random, but I, I had uh, published some papers on the topic, so, you know, might make sense. Then I started receiving other emails, so this one was asking me about help on some class project for a class called Community Studies Project 12, which I had no idea what it was. Uh, okay, weird. Uh, and then I started receiving, you know, uh, hate emails, uh, wishing me all the, you know, uh, all sorts of bad things and so on. And this was in a in a short uh, time frame. <coughs> so what was going on here? Uh, well, later on, I discovered that. 
someone posted this screenshot on uh, on fortune on the political incorrect board on fortune uh, and this was uh, you know an anonymized a blurred out a screenshot of a class assignment where a professor was asking students to go on the community and start posting about controversial topics, you know, uh, gender issues, LGBTQ issues, women's rights, all these kind of things. And if you are at all familiar with the community, you know, that's a very much uh, alt-right uh, community. So they were not pleased with this. And uh, they also, po you know, they posted this screenshot, they blurred out the email address down there. Uh, but they didn't blur it out completely, so you can see g at something.edu. So they interpolated it in the thread and they got convinced that it was me uh, for whatever reason. So they found an old email address of mine that sort of fit in there. Uh, they mistyped it, but uh, that doesn't matter. And so they decided to go and, uh, and attack. So, you know, they put out uh, some of my public information, uh, they called for attacks, and then they started posting templates of emails to send me. So this was the, the email that I received, the first email I showed was posted as an example on, on Fortune, and I later received the same exact email. Eventually they figured out it wasn't me uh, and they stopped, okay? Uh, but this gives you an idea of what these coordinated uh, harassment attacks look like and what we call uh, a raid. And, uh, you know, as you can imagine, if I receive this kind of attack, um, you know, as a white male professor, whatever, you can imagine how much um, other types of demographics might be uh, affected by this. And after that, you know, this kind of blew up. Now we, we hear about it um, every day. We hear about, you know, uh, celebrities and uh, um, gamers, all sorts of people being, uh, uh, being attacked online. And so we start to study this, uh, this phenomenon in our, uh, uh, in our work, and we found that it's, uh, it's quite common. So in our limited view of uh, you know, the political incorrect board, we looked at attacks targeted against YouTube, specifically YouTube videos. We find that it happens about two to five times a day, which you know, it's, uh, it's quite a lot, given that it's only one community. It's fairly small, comparatively speaking, to you know, other platforms. Uh, and so on and so forth. So what are we going to see uh, today? I want to give you an overview of four uh, projects that I did. So the first one is this coordinated attacks against uh, YouTube videos. So somebody posts a link to a YouTube video that for whatever reason they don't like, you know, it might be against uh, what they believe, they might want to uh, harass the person and so on. And basically they invite people to storm and disrupt the video in the in the comments. The second one is about Zoom bombing. So that's a similar threat uh, that kind of emerged during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And these are people who go and disrupt Zoom meetings like the one with uh, uh, Amin. You know, hopefully since then, uh, some mitigations have been developed to sort of make it uh, uh, more difficult. Uh, and then I'll talk about some other work I did on automatically identifying uh, uh, online risks in private conversations online, so uh, cyberbullying and sexual solicitation and uh, things like that. And finally, I will conclude with the work that we did in looking at what happens after uh, communities get the platform, because the most natural uh, way of dealing with online hate and uh, conspiracy theories and whatever is just suspending those accounts, suspending those communities and so on. Uh, but these are real people, so they will move somewhere else. And what happens then? That's something that we need to keep in mind. So to begin uh, understanding what we are talking about, um, let me tell you a little bit about 4chan, uh, which is the first community that we studied. So 4chan is uh, uh, an image board, and so people can post an image that starts a thread, and then they can discuss it. It's uh, organized under a bunch of topics, uh, various levels of uh, weirdness and toxicity and so on. What we focus is the political incorrect board. 
which is one of the most popular communities that uh, you know uh, creates havoc on the internet. They did things like uh, you know turning uh, Microsoft's chatbot K uh, racist a few years ago. Uh, they organized all sorts of raids. They tried to. They claim that they sort of uh, were uh, extremely influential in getting President Trump elected through these kind of meme wars and so on and so forth. Uh, what's interesting about 4chan compared to other communities out there is that uh, at any point in time there can be only a certain number of threads active. And so every time a new thread is created, uh, a thread has to die basically, it's archived. And after it's archived, it goes into this archive for a week and then it's deleted. So content is also ephemeral. And, as you, and also, uh, users are anonymous, there are no accounts, so anybody can post and there is no way of telling who's posting what. And as you can imagine, this combination of anonymity and ephemerality sort of uh, encourages all sorts of bad behavior, especially when there is no moderation uh, from the administrators and so on. So just to give you a sense, we find that uh, the, medium the median lifetime of a thread on 4chan is 47 minutes, so they are fairly short-lived. And uh, we uh, started collecting data from, uh, from 4chan, we're still collecting it, so um, this is from a couple of years ago, we had uh, over 134 million posts, so it's fairly large, not as large as uh, you know, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever, but it's still uh, fairly large, we're still collecting uh, this kind of data. And then we decided to focus on this coordinated uh, uh, hate or harassment campaigns. And the way this works, as the example I showed you at the beginning, you know, somebody will post a thread <laughs> calling for an attack, and then people will get together and carry out the attack. So they, what they might do is, uh, you know, doxing the person, showing, finding more information about them, you know, social media handles, or, you know, even worse, uh, private information, and so on. Uh, and then they will go and execute the attack, so they will post hate speech and all sorts of uh, bad content and so on, and ultimately uh, cause harm. And in this process, you know, many dynamics uh, emerge, so, you know, they will uh, post uh, evidence of what they did, they will say, oh, did you see that, did you see how they reacted, they will uh, congratulate each other, uh, and so on and so forth. So how do we automatically trace this? So we decided to focus on YouTube videos because we found that uh, it was the most popular domain linked on the platform. That's true for any social media, probably YouTube is uh, the most popular content out there. And we found examples of attacks called against YouTube videos. So they will post a link to the video and then people are supposed to go and uh, uh, you know, attack the poster in the comments. And if you remember, threads on 4chan are ephemeral, so they have a lifetime. So what we were interested in understanding first was, uh, can we see an effect on the YouTube comments uh, after a link is posted on 4chan? So if a link is posted, uh, posted on 4chan, we expect people to click on it, go and comment on the YouTube video. And since the thread is ephemeral, that makes our life somewhat easier because we can sort of see, you know, between zero and one, that's the lifetime of the thread. How many comments do we see? Do we see a spike in comments? And we do. Uh, but that's not telling us much because that's what we expect to see in any social media platform, right? Once somebody posts a link somewhere, we expect, you know, the, the reason why they're posting it is for people to go and visit it. Uh, and engage with it, and so on and so forth. So we needed something uh, slightly more sophisticated, and so we resorted to uh, signal processing, essentially. So the idea there is that uh, how can we mo simply model this behavior of uh, having a synchronization thread where people coordinate and then the YouTube video where we're actually posting comments. And uh, cross-correlation is this metric that is used to identify, to uh, model how synchronized two signals are. So what we did, we modeled the comments on uh, 4chan and the comments on YouTube as signals. 
as a you know train of impulses and whatever. And then we use this mathematical technique to find out how synchronized they are. Ideally, somebody will post a hateful comment on YouTube and then immediately go back and report on the thread, this is what I did uh, and this is what happened. In reality, it's a little laxer than that, but you get the idea. And this is interesting because it gives us a number, which is the lag between the two signals, that then we can use later on to automatically identify videos that we believe were rated. And what you see in this plot is basically, uh, we have a synchronization here, so zero indicates perfect synchronization. And then we look at hate comments. So we um, ran the comments through uh, the hate base API, which is um, uh, an API to identify hate speech. And so the dots in red contain hate, the ones in blue do not contain hate. And what you can see is that basically the smaller the lag, the more synchronized the fortune thread and the YouTube comments are, the more hate we see. And if, the, if there is really no synchronization, there is really not much hate. So that allows us to extract a set of videos that have been uh, targeted just by looking at this number. We don't really even need to look at the comments. We don't need to, um, you know, whatever, train classifiers or large language models these days uh, to identify what's hateful and what's not, and so on and so forth. So that's fairly accurate and quick to do. And then by looking at this set of videos, uh, well, we made some observations. So we find that, uh, as I said, people like to report back. So they will talk about what they did. They will talk about uh, what happened in the attack. Uh, potentially how it affected the victim. So some of these videos were actually live streams. So this could be done you know, in, in real time instead of just being um, uh, a video posted there uh, to, be, to be watched later. We see that they overwhelmingly target uh, uh, vulnerable demographics. So we see attacks uh, called uh, you know, against women, against members of the LGBTQ community, against uh, minorities and so on and so forth. Um, and then in some cases we see that even if the attack does not uh, start as targeted, so it's not calling for an attack against a specific demographics and so on, the commenters will go after other commenters who may be part of uh, certain minorities. So sort of the attack becomes targeted as it, as it goes uh, in, a, in an opportunistic way, if you, if you like. We see a lot of concern trolling, which is sort of interesting. So these would be attackers who pretend to be real concerned citizens about, you know, uh, sort of what I, what, I, what I showed you at the beginning, you know, when the person pretended to be, to be concerned about racism and so on and so forth. And uh, they try to get uh, the victim into, um, you know, either uh, contradicting themselves or saying something uh, uh, controversial or uh, whatever, or just waste their time. And why is that interesting? Because it's very difficult for moderators to identify this kind of behavior. It looks legitimate. It's just, uh, it's just not. And what do we do about it? You know, it's not necessarily against the terms of service. It's not hate speech. Uh, Actually, probably it's uh, it looks exactly like real people being concerned about uh, about an issue, at least on the surface. And then we also find that you know this is a trolling community, so people troll each other all the time. So oftentimes they don't act upon uh, these threats. They say you know uh, you know we we are not your personal army, uh, NYPA, is something you often see. So we don't want to participate into this attack. Uh, go away. And so on. So it's kind of a multifaceted um, uh, landscape. And then we want to understand what can we do about it. So we have this set of videos that were attacked, and clearly YouTube has a hard time moderating them. 
because we all know that you know content moderators are a scarce resource they're overwhelmed there is so much content being generated all the time that you know where, where do you even start so we developed a system that basically given a video extracts information about the video and so this would be uh you know the title of the video um how, how long is it what are the tags you know we look at specific keywords you know cops woman whatever we look at images so we look at the thumbnail of the video so we have a, a deep learning model that can tell us what is in the thumbnail and then we extract the audio and we uh, we look for keywords in the audio as well and the idea is can we take all the all these signals and combine them to identify uh, videos that are likely to be moderated to, to, to be attacked sorry and so if that works that could be an additional signal for uh, for youtube or whichever platform we want to uh, to protect telling content moderators you know this is a video that you should pay particular attention to because it's likely to be attacked in uh, in the future so this could be a prioritization uh system that could be used by content moderators and it works uh reasonably well uh, any questions so far yep on the previous slide um, the bottom statistic about the AC mm -hmm. of 0.94. Yeah. Have you applied that forward looking and then seen if the videos you predict would be rated R rated or is that purely retrospective? Uh, this one was purely retrospective, yes, uh -huh. because it wasn't easy to extract uh, this ground truth of videos that would be attacked. Yeah, but th that's a good point, yes. Uh, also, it might overfit, so it might be biased. Uh, on videos that were attacked by that specific community. So there might be other communities that target other types of videos. Yeah, the second question, though, can we predict which videos? We have an example. Whatever is shown on the, mm -hmm. on the screen is theoretical or hypothetical. We have a specific example. I'm shouting so much. No, it's just that uh, people are, there are people online and they oh, can hear you even if you don't shout. If you're <laughs> So anyway. uh, yes, yes, yes. We have examples of videos. So this would be uh, typically uh, videos about uh, social justice or related topics that would get specifically. I think you are giving only a hypothetical. Just give, just give a very specific example wherein the YouTube removed the particular item. Oh, where they remove? They, they don't remove the particular item, but they would remove the hate speech. So what we are looking at is really hate speech in the right. comments. So do you have, again, mm -hmm. I keep asking the same thing. Do you have a particular example? Yes, so yes, yes. So the I don't have it on the slides, but what the what the attackers would do, they would go and attack the um, uh, the creator of the video with all sorts of slurs and hate speech and uh, and so on. Yeah. No. Okay. My, I have a quick question. Yeah. My question is related to the, uh, I, maybe we'll enter this in a later stage of the talk, but that higher strategy of the prioritization of the content itself and not necessarily the yeah. the, 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 the attack. Uh, does that, is, is that because of the space in which the hate and harm happens that the, this prioritization is, is particularly useful so that moderators are more, uh, it, out in the look, but what is, but it seems that it's kind of like a remediative strategy instead of a preventive run, right? It would be a, a remediative strategy, but it would allow moderators to look at uh, at the risky comments uh, in a more timely uh, fashion, right? Because the problem is that uh, the problem with content moderation is that there is so much content out there that uh, uh, it takes a while to act upon that content, and especially with online harassment and so on. You know, once something is posted, if you don't get it very quickly, uh, the harm is done. So, you know, sure, YouTube goes back and removes these comments, uh, but if they do it, you know, days later, they, you know, it's it's not really very helpful. Yeah. So uh, then, I wanted to talk about. Oh, yeah. 
I have a question about scale. Yeah. Um, have you looked at the breadth of this trolling raid activity from 4chan to YouTube relative to the entire sort of uh, inter-platform type of practices that are going on across the breadth of 4chan and mm -hmm. also relative to any, I wouldn't say non-normative kind of interact cross-platform behaviors, but maybe even pro social kind mm -hmm. of behavior. So as relative to the whole scale of cross-platform activity and the pro-social side yes. of cross-platform activity, how does this sort of trolling raid-like behavior so scale? So it, uh, uh, it is a minority. I want to say uh, among all the videos we saw on, uh, on 4chan, um, it would be in the order of 1% or something, the ones that are actually attacked. So most videos are posted for, you know, whatever, this is a funny video or whatever it might be. Uh, most of the interpretable activity is, uh, is news. So people will post news articles. Um, and then, you know, there is some interpretable activity because people will go and post uh, comments. We did some work studying the hateful comments. On news articles, we find that often news articles are taken out of context uh, and just posted on um, uh, on 4chan to make a point, uh, you know, especially for you know immigration issues or or things like that. Yeah. So now, besides the management of YouTube or Facebook, mm -hmm. even government agencies. They try to keep track of such mm -hmm. issues, right? Yeah. And again, even for them, it should be a very major task. You may yes. not be able to fully solve the problem. Yes. Especially if you are doing it in a cross-platform fashion, there is so much data and, uh, you know, using this kind of techniques that just look at synchronization might be more robust than looking at text that people can try and, you know, change the way they speak to avoid being detected and so on, but it's, it's a huge problem. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah, then after doing this work, we realized that a similar problem was happening on, uh, on Zoom. So we saw, you know, news reports and so on, or even, you know, in our own online classes, they would get disrupted by trolls. And we found a similar uh, pattern of, you know, these Zoom links being posted on 4chan. We also looked at Twitter, so they will be posted on Twitter as well, with an invitation of going and disrupting the meeting. Okay. And the difference there compared to what I talked before um, was that these are, uh, you know, real time events. So, you know, you cannot attack a Zoom meeting after the Zoom meeting has ended and uh, uh, you cannot uh, um, yeah, so it, it, it has a smaller window of opportunity. And the other thing is that we can see links being posted on 4chan uh, or on Twitter for Zoom meetings, but we cannot really see what's going on on the Zoom meeting, while on YouTube we could go and check the comments. So we applied a slightly different uh, uh, technique here, so we had basically uh, multiple annotators go and check the threads to tell if it was a call for an attack or not so that then we could characterize uh, what was going on there and we found 134 calls for zoom bombing over a period of uh, uh, a month if i remember correctly so it, it was uh, you know that was the beginning of the pandemic so it was a problem that was kind of surging and what did we find here uh, well we found that the Huge majority of uh, class of uh, attacks here are calling to disrupt online classes, online lectures. So it would be uh, high school classes or uh, college classes. You know, everybody went online, so it was, uh, you know, very common, and uh, nobody knew how to secure these things. The second interesting thing we found that seventy percent of these attacks uh, were called by insiders. So it would be legitimate students in the class asking strangers to, you know, disrupt their own classes because they were bored. 
And then we also found that most of them are targeting meetings that are happening in real time. So, it's, you know, there was wording in the thread saying, you know, my class is happening right now, come and, uh, and disrupt it. So these were not really planned uh, ahead of time. And all these are interesting because uh, when defenses for Zoom meetings were developed, they were assuming a completely different threat model. So they were assuming that somebody from outside would come <coughs> and disrupt the meeting. So they would tell you, you know, set up passwords. But if your attacker is an insider, they can just give the password to someone else. They would tell us, you know, set up a waiting room so that you can tell who's real and who's not. And, you know, kick out attackers. But actually we found many instances of students saying, oh, here is a list of the names in the class. So you should adopt, uh, you know, the name of some other student so that the teacher wouldn't be able to tell uh, who's an attacker or who's not. We see that oftentimes the attackers are, are taking the name of the host so that the participants are confused, they don't know what's going on, uh, and so on and so forth. So after a while, services started developing like, you know, one-time unique links for each participant, but this is not very common. Uh, and it's also typically a paid uh, option that they offer. So I don't know if it's still the case, but for Zoom, you could only do that if you had an enterprise um, account. And so that would then protect, you know, later on we talk to many, um, you know, uh, people from volunteering organizations who would, who would have, you know, uh, volunteer run uh, Zoom meetings or seminars and so on. It wouldn't be an option for them to adopt this kind of, this kind of defenses. Another area that I looked at, which is sort of similar in spirit, so we were looking at private conversations on Instagram. So everything I, I talked about so far, uh, well, not the Zoom bombing, but the YouTube stuff, uh, happens in public. So we wanted to understand what happens in uh, the private space, what kind of risks and malicious activity uh, are users uh, uh, victims of. And so here, this is part of a large uh, NSF project uh, with uh, 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 several other institutions. So what we did, uh, we set up a data donation for Instagram. So par our participants, in particular uh, teenagers and young adults, could donate their data to us. And they could also label the data themselves among what did they think was safe, what did they think was unsafe, uh, what made them feel uncomfortable, uncomfortable and so on. Uh, which was interesting because there is a lot of research showing that if you ask external participants or external annotators who are not the victims themselves or are not in the loop, uh, you know, what they end up labeling doesn't really match the experience of, uh, of the victims. And so we had over 28,000 chats with uh, millions of messages. Uh, some of these chats were labeled as safe or unsafe. So we wanted to understand what do unsafe conversations look like. And so the first thing we found is that just by looking at, uh, again, metadata, timing, um, information, and so on, we can tell with fairly high accuracy whether a conversation is going to be risky or not. And why? because the participants tend to disengage. So if they start being bullied or they start uh, you know, receiving solicitation or what, something that they don't like, they will stop responding. If they are being bullied by multiple people in, uh, in group chats, there will be this sort of one-way stream of messages. And why is that interesting? Because that potentially allows us to develop uh, detection systems that don't really go and look into the content of conversations. So they are more privacy friendly. They could be applied when there is, you know, end to end encryption. So we cannot see the content, but we still want to do something to, uh, to protect participants. And so we developed, um, uh, again, a set of classifiers. So we looked at metadata. So everything I said that doesn't look into content. And then we also looked at text and we look at images and so on. 
And what we found is that, as I said, the metadata classifier is fairly accurate by itself. So potentially it could be used at least as a strong indicator that something wrong is going on. Then obviously using all classifiers looking into text and so on uh, is more accurate. And then we also found that if you wanted to identify the specific type of risk, so we have several types uh, in our work, you know, bullying, sexual solicitation, hate speech, uh, we also look at spam and things like that, then we need to look at content. Yes? What sort of metadata were you looking at? Timing of it? So it would be um, uh, timing of the messages, it would be the length of the conversation, uh, sometimes the participants will specify the relationship with the other party, if it was a stranger, a friend, an acquaintance, a partner, or whatever, so information like that. Um, so yeah, if you want to look at the type of uh, risk, we need to look at all of them. But this sort of gives us a direction to look into, you know, maybe this metadata uh, features are uh, promising to be adopted in a scenario when we want to guarantee more privacy to the parties, which is what, you know, uh, we all agree is good. And uh, uh, most messaging platforms are going in that direction. So we have end-to-end -end encryption and, uh, and so on. Finally, I want to conclude with this uh, uh, other project in which we looked at these challenges uh, that deal with the platforming specifically. So. Coming from computer security, you know, we used to work on uh, anti-spam, anti-fraud, anti-malware, whatever. And so the solution was always you know, block content, delete content, uh, and the problem will go away. In these cases, it's different because we are not dealing with automated programs. We are dealing with real people who can, uh, you know, reorganize, go somewhere else, uh, potentially go somewhere else out of sight. And so there can be, you know, they can get radicalize more, those communities are not moderated, and so on and so forth. So we looked at two communities that were the platform from Reddit at uh, different points in time. One was the Donald, uh, which became infamous for sharing uh, conspiracy theories and all sorts of uh, disinformation and so on. At some point in time, in 2019, it was quarantined, so people could still access it, but they would receive a warning. And so that's what, uh, you know, set the administrators off saying, oh, they're after us, they're going to ban us. Let's create our own community, the Donald.win, on their own website, and let's migrate there. And then later on, the community was actually banned on Reddit, and so people moved to this new community. And the second one is our incels, uh, who are, you know, the involuntary celibates uh, who've been linked to um, misogyny and acts of uh, violence and uh, you know mass shootings and whatnot, they were also banned and they moved to their own forum. So we wanted to understand what happens to these new communities that are now somewhere else and they are not on a mainstream website. Uh, so they are, uh, you know, there's probably no moderation or very lax moderation uh, and so on. So, uh, yes. If they are not, uh, you know, in case they are not on the mainstream mm -hmm. website, then their effect will be not that significant, right? Because for people like me, they are, I'm not going to find them in, in general. Yes, but they could coordinate and come back to, to YouTube, for example, uh, to mount attacks, or they could. Uh, uh, you know, if there is a link between online hate and offline violence, they could organize, you know, acts of violence offline. So, uh, so they themselves interact. Yes. And, and then they can go, you know, if they're, if they're building a conspiracy theory, then they, they can go and push it to other communities. Because I was comparing the situation yeah. with money swindlers. You know, a company cheats yeah. people of money. Then when they shut down, then they go somewhere else. Uh, with the another name. Yes, so, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. But here, you know, the web is all interconnected, so they can they can still come back in other forms. So what we did, we did a regression discontinuity analysis. So um, 
this is an example from uh, from the Donald. We have the same thing uh, happening on incels. So the line in the middle is when the migration happened. And uh, what we find, first of all, not everybody migrates. So the number of users on the new community decreases. And why is that? Well, likely because Reddit is a general purpose community. They have so many subreddits and people can have you know, very various interests. So they might be tangentially interested in whatever the Donald is talking about, but not enough to you know, create a new account on another community or go and check it and so on. So only the people who are really committed would go. But of, among these people, we find that in general, their activity increases. So they become more active. Yes. Hi, I'm, my, my name is Lynn. Um, so this part where you said the othering, is it through a lexical content analysis in looking at words like they and them, things like that? Uh, yes, yes. So I was getting to that. We find that they start talking about we a lot more, about them, and so on. We find that hate speech in general increases. So yeah, not only their activity increases, but potentially the community becomes more insular and you know gets even more polarized because now there is only the people who are all you know like-minded there is no content moderation and so on and so forth yes uh, yeah i have a question about uh, so could we assume that people who choose to migrate are not like exactly comparable to those who stay then could we mm -hmm. assume their trend is continuous that enables us to use rdb uh, to use RDD? Yeah. Because I assume that people who are uh, migrate, mm -hmm. who choose to migrate, they are more dedicated to yes. the topic or more polarized. Yes. So are they, can they really qualify as a counterfactual of others? Uh, well, not necessarily, but what we wanted to understand here is how does the community uh, change, right? So now the community will only be made of extreme people or committed people and will be outside of the moderation capabilities of, of Reddit in this case. So if what we wanted to understand here is, you know, what happens next. And, uh, you know, this opens up many resource directions on understanding, you know, is the platforming of these communities in this uh, shape and form the right way uh, to go? You know, probably the toxicity on Reddit decreased overall. So if that was the goal of Reddit's um, uh, administrators, you know, they succeeded. But overall, as a society, these people didn't go away. You know, they just moved uh, out of sight. So that's what we need to, to keep in mind. Uh, so to conclude, you know, I showed you a number of examples where computational methods can help study and identify coordinated online aggressions. Um, and I pointed a few directions in which, you know, this kind of techniques could help platforms develop better mitigations. But once we do that, we should also keep in mind these potential unintended consequences of, you know, just if you ban people or remove content, it doesn't necessarily go away, it just goes somewhere else. Uh, and with this, I thank you and I'm open to questions. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, my name's Adam, um, pretty tall white guy wearing a blue striped shirt. I have a question about the Instagram private messages piece of your research. And I appreciate you providing all the detail about where, where you derived your initial data set. Mm -hmm. But given that it's explicitly about a tool you've developed to work on private messaging, mm -hmm. what do you see as the use case for whatever it is you've developed. I mean, I, I can spin it out, but I would love to hear what you think, because it's not like Facebook can use it to monitor what they could, but we don't want them to, private messages. You know, so where, where, where does that better prediction come into any sort of utilitarian play? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think in general there is always um, a tension and a discussion whether platforms should re read your private messages and look for Ill illegal content or whatever, or protect their users and so on. 
Um, and in general, privacy is, uh, you know, obviously, it's, it's a big concern. So that's, uh, that's why people are advocating to move to end-to-end -end encryption and so on. So what we wanted to understand there is, can there still be some indicators that can be used without looking into, uh, you know, what is being said or even who we, who we are talking to and so on. Try it. Okay. Yeah. So in the data collection piece for the same study, I know you had users volunteer the mm -hmm. private messages and you did that analysis. Was there a strategy <coughs> in approaching the platforms to see if they would give you some of the data that you would need to do this research or was this more of just uh, E yes, so What's their response on? it's uh, it's it's always tricky and in general getting data from getting user data from platforms, especially if it's not public data, um, it's something they will not do. Um, and that's that's one of the reasons why we had this uh, volunteer based uh, approach. Uh, in addition to the fact that we could, you know, they could label their content and tell us, you know what was risky and what wasn't because if we did it ourselves probably we would end up with a very different uh, definition and you know then maybe whatever we developed wouldn't really work yeah so i wanted to um look at the discourse raised here in your conclusion to ask a few mm -hmm. questions by effective mitigations are you only interested around the content moderation practices, because there is an argument that has been made that, that there could be another form of mitigation around amplification and incentivization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that would then mean looking at different sets of practices that may be more positive or more pro-social. Have you uh, considered any of that type of... So once you identify this content, you can do uh, various things. So I have work that looks at, in the disinformation space, that looks at soft moderation. So you don't remove the content, but you add a warning label, right? Mm -hmm. So that is one thing. Uh, there are these, you know, uh, shadow banning or demoting content, you know, not showing it in, um, uh, in recommendations and so on. That's something that could be plug plugged in uh, into this kind of, uh, of systems, right? So instead of deleting the content or removing the content, you just don't show it to, to somebody or you use it as an input to your recommendation algorithm and suddenly that content is not recommended anymore, etc. Sorry, just to follow up, I'm just <laughs> wondering if there's any means with which there are other ways to incentivize platforms around doing non, less negative, less bullying, less um, uh, prejudicial work. Um, yeah, that would be that would be great. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's very difficult to get feedback from them and also see you know what uh, you know what happened with uh, with Twitter in the last few months. Basically, uh, any content moderation went away, kind of, or at least from what we can see. Um, and so, yeah, you know, obviously it, it, it would be great to have a more civil and a safer uh, environment. Um, you know, I'm not sure where the priorities lie really for, uh, you know, for different stakeholders and so on. We have a question from a yeah. guest online. Um, did you study the growth of these of the new communities over time, in particular active recruiting on mainstream platforms with link and YouTube video comments, et cetera? And if mm -hmm. they grew, uh, did they stay more toxic? or uh, have more othering? Uh, we didn't look into that specifically um, for this study. Uh, those communities grew uh, in general, uh, in the sense that, you know, that dot win type of community, uh, it sort of attracted more the platform communities. So it sort of became a conglomerate of, of communities instead of just being, uh, you know, the Donald. So that we, we observe, yes. Interesting that you raised, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, that you raised Twitter. I was actually one of the council members on Twitter uh, since this funding, and then I resigned, and uh, Musk actually instigated a harassment against me and the two women that did, then he fired everybody else. Um, so the, the, this, this thing too, for me, I, 
I like what you're doing here, and also I'm working on some similar methods. I, um, I feel that a lot, because we're in the US, it's very US-centric, the technologies, that we're always looking at the content. So, you know, I like some of the work that has been done elsewhere, where it's like actors, behavior, and content, ABC, and the focus is overwhelmingly on content. Mm -hmm. And my book is really looking at, say, in the literature, it's known as amplifiers, like influencers, right? And so the categories of actors and, and how we detect who they are and whether they impact like, for example, swarming, and what does it mean? And so I'd like to have a discussion afterwards, too, about mm -hmm. actors and behaviors, because I feel that that needs to be looked at more, and then yep. the impact in terms of the First Amendment and what we can do about it. Yes. And because we're at a law school, I've been looking at Lawrence Lessig's work and what he was saying about replicant behavior and and what how that pertains to the First Amendment. And he was saying that if technology changes so much and impacts democracy, then we should do something about it. And so for me, this is a missing bit of the conversation. I feel it's a societal effect, but it's so siloed that actually we not look at it in a very integrated way. Yeah, thanks. Do you have any questions for you? Okay. I think I have a couple. I do have a couple of questions. The first is on the slide that you showed us that showed various stages of, mm -hmm. of, of an attack. Over on the far right, you had uh, one individual who, who was the victim. Mm -hmm. And in, in your examples about when you yourself were victimized, that that was uh, personal and individual. Yeah. When when these YouTube attacks, this YouTube raids take place, then these are these are more or less public postings rather than private postings, mm -hmm. correct? So I, I wonder if you have a sense of a sense of proportion about that. I mean, are, are the raids typically for posting in public spaces, or do they uh, frequently involve the doxing and, and finding a way to uh, disrupt the individual with, you know, within their own private communication space? I think, uh, I think the public ones are more common because they are easier to carry out. Uh, it's easier to find public information about people. It's easier to get traction. It's easier to show that, uh, you know, you did something because it's out there now. Uh, so, you know, they both happen, but if I had to, I don't have hard numbers, but if I had to guess the public ones are, you know, happen more often. Yes. It, it takes more preparation and more orchestration to, you know, truly dock someone and go after their private communications and so on. Thank you. One more question, please. You you mentioned um, uh, when we've spoken before, particularly in regard to Zoom bombing, that um, one of the comments that the Zoom bombers post tend to be racist, they tend to be misogynistic, <laughs> but it was your impression that that those comments were not born out of uh, prejudice and, and enmity, but uh, were rather the most disruptive things that somebody could come up with to say that would um, yes uh, i wonder if you could elaborate on that and yeah you, so we had uh, we had some follow-up work that's not published yet but we spoke with victims of zoom bombing uh and several people told us that you know their feeling obviously they're not in the mind of these attackers but their feeling was that they just joined to disrupt the meeting and then they found um you know the most the low hanging fruits so they started harassing, uh, you know, people of color, or if the speaker was a woman, or whatever they could find. But that was not the original uh, goal of the attack. They didn't. They didn't target the meeting because the um, uh, you know the speaker was uh, a certain person or anything like that. Yeah. Turning back to the YouTube rates, then, uh, which you said, for example, as a social justice video was a mm -hmm. uh, likely target. Do, do you think it's the same the same activity going on? In other words, do you think the culture war is really being fought on on YouTube in these raids that that people who are very opposed, um, uh, very ideologically uh, opposite what's in these videos are are doing these attacks, or are they just really easy sitting ducks for major disruption? And, and so, do you think they have a different character, in other words, uh, than the zoo bomb? I I think so. I think that uh, at least the the way we saw it, the, the for the videos, they typically would talk about what the video is about. 
so there would be a more targeted uh, uh, purpose. For the Zoom bombing, it was just that all these high schoolers were bored, at least early in the pandemic, and they wanted, uh, you know, some thrill. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. Can I also comment on Joe's uh, question, the last question on the YouTube ways he's versus the, the Zoom bombing? I would assume what you just said too, because during COVID, it was boredom on, be, on the behalf of those people taking part in Zoom uh, sessions, mainly high schools, but also more than that too, right? But YouTube race, I think, will be characterized by, by the presence of amplifiers, influencers who are then coordinating it by doing a mock video. What is it? This is the video. This is my mock video. I'm mocking you. I'm using coded language and my followers are not going to harass you. Yeah. So I think there is a another link there that there is someone who's openly then mocking a video to do to, to make that actually happen. Whereas Zoom bombing is more like everybody and then do it together. There's no like one hit on shows or something like that. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, on uh, on fortune specifically, since everybody's anonymous, uh, there is sort of this, you know, hive mind or whatever of these attacks, but they you know, the same raids can happen in, in a number of platforms. Yes. So there could be the influencer directing their followers to, uh, to harass someone and, you know, yeah, that happens too. All right. Well, thank you everybody. And one last round of applause for John Luca. Right, thank you. Thank you for those who joined online and, uh, there's more food outside if people want to help themselves to more lunch. Uh, but thank you everybody. Wednesday, it's good.